fear is common, still you're calling me. When faith is lost and my hope exhausted, you will be my strength. When my mind says I'm not good enough, God, you're
Dear Jesus, we just thank you that you have done great things in our life and you are just continued to do a good work until you come home. We love us and in your name we pray. Amen. Isn't it just a beautiful day out here? I'll tell you. At at um, seven, hey there. They were beeping. I, I think it was at you guys, but um, at seven thirty this morning when we pulled up here. Well, I got here a few minutes after that, but uh, it was very interesting because from the road you you couldn't see the cross because of the the fog rolling in. But it was fun to see it kind of open up and and uh, be there. Sometimes. Sometimes in the last, I want to say in the last six months, but I don't know if it's been six months. It could have been three months. It could have been a year and a half. But since like February or March, um, every once in a while, it's just like, what day is it? What's happening? And this is, this is kind of one of those days. So I am very glad that we have an incredible crew. We have a great worship team and crew that I don't know if you understand how difficult it is to make everything out here work. Um, it has to work, but it also has to work because as soon as we're done here, we rush back where we have internet and we get it online for those who aren't here so that they can see it. And um, it's, it's a little frustrating for someone like me who uses the internet for so many different things um, to realize that that hill right there, that's fiber optic. It's communication for Duluth. And there's like super fast screaming internet right there. <laughs> so close <laughs> and yet so far. We are in a series. Um, I know it's a little warmer than last week, which means it will be a little shorter than last week. Directly related there, <laughs> the weather thing. We're in a series on James and we're in week 10. And the question we're asking in the series is what happens next? And there's been so many different things happening. What we're going to talk about this week, um, we're just moving through the book of James in the next passage. We're going to talk about wisdom. We're talking about wisdom for God's pathway to the good life. And I figured since we're talking about wisdom, I had to wear my Yoda shirt because this is the wisdom from Yoda. And you're far enough away that you're not tempted to try to read it. So you can do that later. Um, but we're going to talk about um, the good life and, and uh, 2020 has been just one of the craziest years that I've ever experienced. So many things are happening. So many things are happening in America, all over the world, circumstances out of our control. But remember, we've talked about this a lot. God uses all kinds of circumstances to get our attention. And like we said last week, he uses all kinds of circumstances to help us grow. It could be um, good things, but it could be a job loss. It could be an illness, could be a, a quarantine. It could be being confronted with social and civil issues. And it's not that God causes these issues, but God is the master at using these things to help us grow and to bring good out of them for us. I would say it'd be a safe assumption that most of us would not declare 2020 an opportune time to live the good life. Probably not. Most would not even say, we're living the good life. Here's the thing. Th this is kind of like the big truth for today. God wants to give you the good life. It may or may not be defined how you think it is at the moment. But God wants to give you the good life in the middle of the wild and lonely and painful, crazy seasons of upheaval and uncertainty. Right in the middle of it. And at the end of our text that we're going to read today, the, the final verse, James says this. He kind of gives us a goal in verse 18, and he says, Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness, a good harvest. Let me show of hands, whether you're here or online, doesn't matter. Who wants a harvest? Who wants a, who wa who wants a good harvest? Who wants the world to be made right again? Who wants to live the good life? See, all of us. How do we get there? How can we experience the harvest that God has in mind here? James is pretty clear, and here's what he says, starting in verse 13. 
he asks the question, who is wise and understanding among you? And when he asks that, I have a feeling most people would say, he's talking about me here. Who's wise and understanding? He qualifies it because if that is you, here's what he says to do. Let them show it. You're wise and understanding? Show it by your good life, by your deeds, done in the humility that comes from wisdom. He talks about being wise and understanding. Kind of, they're, they're similar but actually different concepts. The, the word wise is just describing someone who has um, the, the moral insight and skill in the practical issues of life. Just like common sense, you know? The understanding is intellectual perception, but it, it moves further than that and goes to the ability to make good decisions. And so he's saying, how many of you have common sense? How many of you have that moral insight and skill and practical issues in life? How many of you have the intellectual perception and ability to make good decisions in life? He says, show me. Let him show it, he says. That's kind of the original show and tell. If I didn't know better, I think James was from Missouri, the show me state. He says, show me that. You see, wisdom, wisdom is not measured by degrees or diplomas. It doesn't matter if you've been to school or not. He says it's not measured by degrees or diploma. It's measured by deeds. It's not, matter, it's not a matter of acquiring truth and getting truth from lectures and books and podcasts and whatever. It's about applying truth to life. The good life and deeds are best revealed, he says, in the humility of wisdom because a truly wise person is humble. Verse 14, he goes on, he says, but, now there's going to be a contrast, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, it's not necessarily an external thing. He says, you have this in your heart? He said, that's not something to brag about. He said, don't boast about that or deny the truth because true wisdom doesn't have any room for envy or, or selfish ambition. Those aren't things to brag about. He says those are the kinds of, of attitudes that literally deny the truth. And what's their origin when people have that? Verse 15, here's their origin. Such wisdom, and you have to use the air quotes, such wisdom, the kind that they're talking about there, not real wisdom, but such wisdom like that that has the bitter envy and selfish ambition in their hearts, does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. It's, it's kind of harsh. It's earthly. It, it's, it's worldly. It's unspiritual. That means it's, it's of the flesh and it's demonic. Literally what he's saying is that type of attitude um, is, is from the world, the flesh, and the devil. When we have that kind of attitude, when we have those things in our hearts, and he goes on to explain, he says, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, if that's the kind of, quote, wisdom you have, where you have that, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. So what type of life does that attitude, does that type of wisdom produce? I can sum it up in one word, messy, messy. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, how many of you experienced a messy life? I'm not talking about like cluttered clothes or something like that. I'm talking about life is messed up. That's actually one meaning of the word disorder. And it says it produces disorder in every evil practice. But you know, the word that's translated disorder that we say is messy, it also means this. Uprisings, rebellions, riots. I could say a lot right now about what we're seeing in our world and how, according to James, much of what we're seeing on the news in many of the cities across our nation is a product of the wisdom that is envy and selfish ambition that has no humility involved in it. I'm just going to leave that right there. What's the alternative? Because we don't want that. We don't want that in our lives. We don't want the, that kind of mess in our lives, that kind of disorder. What we want is what's good. Here's what he says in verse 17. But, now he's going to contrast again back to where we started. But the wisdom that comes from heaven, 
the wisdom that's from above, the right kind of wisdom, not the, the stuff that comes from the world, the flesh, and the devil. The right kind of wisdom, he says, is first of all pure. And by pure, he means morally pure. It's innocent. It hasn't done the wrong things. And then it's peace-loving. And as I'm reading through this list, it's like, this is a list of what's not happening in our world right now. It's not pure. It's not innocent. It's not peace-loving right now in our world. The next thing he says is considerate. We're not seeing a whole lot of that in our society, especially in America. It's like, if you disagree with me, you're the enemy. Like, wait a minute. What happened to civility? What happened to being able to talk to somebody you disagree with without yelling or throwing something at them? Because that's what comes from the right kind of wisdom, being able to do that. So when we can't do that, we have the wrong kind of wisdom from the wrong place. He says it's first of all pure, then peace-loving, then considerate. And then a word most people don't like to hear, submissive. It's like, what do you mean? Who am I supposed to submit to? Here's what, he, here's what submissive really means. Easy to be appealed to. It means you're willing to yield. Does it mean you have to yield every time? Does it mean you have to be a doormat? That's not what submissive means. It means willing to yield. That if somebody has a different opinion than you, that you are easy to discuss that with. They know they can appeal to you without you going ballistic and rioting because your opinion's different. He says that's, that's what the wisdom that comes from above gives us. It's, he says it's also full of mercy. Mercy is when we, we give people, they, if we all got what we deserve, often we're saying, we don't deserve this. Yes, you do. So do I. We deserve much worse than we're getting. We don't because of God's grace and his mercy. And he says, if we're going to have the wisdom from heaven, we have to be full of mercy and good fruit. We have to be impartial and sincere, he says. That means fair and honest. And when we hear that description of the kind of wisdom that comes from heaven, it's quite a, quite a difference from the other kind of wisdom. See, you can see all those things that he mentions when it comes to wisdom. Every one of them refers to our interaction with other people. Because we're not an island to ourselves. Our wisdom, if it's the correct wisdom, displays itself in how we interact with others. In other words, it's not about you. When we begin to have the attitude that it's all about us, that's when things get messy. Because that wisdom is not from the right place. And finally, the verse I mentioned earlier, verse 18, says this. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. See, that's what he's saying is, if you have the right kind of wisdom, here's what you're going to be and here's what you're going to do. You're going to be a peacemaker. And by the way, a peacemaker and a peacekeeper are two different things. There are many people who do the wrong thing to keep the peace. Sometimes being a peacemaker means doing the hard thing and saying the hard thing. But he says, peacemakers, if you sow in peace... When the attitude and the heart is right, you will reap a harvest of righteousness. That's the correct wisdom. So, back to our initial question. Do you want a good harvest? Everybody said, yes, I want a good harvest. If you want a good harvest, you're in one of two camps. Everybody here is in one of two camps. You are either building your own kingdom or God's kingdom. One or the other. You're either pursuing your own purposes or God's purposes for your life. See, that's how it works. You choose one or the other. That's how you live your life. And James said, you choose the wrong one and you're going to have disorder and every kind of evil crap in your life. I mean, he doesn't actually say crap, but that's the implication <laughs> there. He says, you choose the other one and you can have a good harvest. So the bottom line is, the pathway to the messy life is pursuing your own purposes and building your own kingdom. That's what James says. When you're all about creating your own comfort, 
pursuing your own happiness above others, pursuing your own success above others, you will wind up struggling with envy, always living by comparison and trying to find your security and significance in all the wrong places. And you won't come out with a good harvest. It will be a messy life. Remember, the roots of the messy life are the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's where that comes from. We think we're doing it for us, and we're actually a puppet of the wrong person. And just here, here's a little hint for you. I love America. I, I, I would want to live nowhere else on the planet than America. I love America. But do you know the American dream really isn't about the good life? It's really the messy life. Because if you pursue the American dream, you're pursuing what feels good. You're pursuing all of the things in the wrong order, and it will be a messy life, not a good life. You see a lot of people that you think, ah, they're living the good life. If you could look a little bit closer into their life, you would see something different. Here's how it goes for most people. Here's the order. Me, other people, and God. They would never say that out loud. But when you watch what they do, he says, show me, remember? When they show you, they're showing you that I'm the most important. Then other people, and then finally God. That's the pathway to a messy life. The pathway, on the other hand, to the good life is pursuing God's purposes and building his kingdom. That that's what's forefront in your mind. Because the truth is, God wants to include you in something much greater than just your own happiness. He wants to use you to bring peace to the world around you. That he wants to go through you to your sphere of influence. You all have one. Some of you have hundreds around you. Some of you have one. But everybody has a sphere of influence, and he wants to, through you, bring peace to your sphere of influence. And that can only happen when the order of our lives is the way it should be. That can only happen when we're pursuing the correct kind of wisdom. That's what extends his kingdom around us. That's where the hope lies. Here's what the order of our lives should be. God. That's the first thing we think about. That's where we're living, to please him. We love him. He loves us. We are sold out to him. Jesus is our number one. And then other people. That's loving God and loving people. We say that a lot around here. The third thing is you. That's the pathway to the good life. When I was uh, just little in the church I went to, they used to say, joy these tell little kids, joy. You know how you find joy? You know how to spell joy, right? J-O-Y. Jesus, others, and you. When that's the order of your life, you can have joy. When you reverse that, you will not have joy. You will have the messy life. If you want the good life, you have to tune into heaven. You have to, to listen to God's word, to his voice. You have to spend time with him in his word every day. You have to embrace his priorities. You have to embrace his purposes and his perspective. And you have to, as James said, humble yourself under his leadership. When we do that, God will enrich our lives beyond our wildest imagination. It's not about stuff. It's not about money. It's not about possessions because we're looking in all the wrong places for the meaning and purpose in life that God has for us. When we put things in the correct order, he will enrich our lives. We will experience the good life. Because when peacemakers sow in peace, they reap a harvest of righteousness. I'd like to ask you to, to bow your heads as we pray. Father, as we're out here in this beautiful creation, we just we thank you so much for this property that you have blessed us with and and we don't even know how you plan on using in the future, but we're excited, Father, to see what's going to happen. But we are grateful that during this crazy time that we can continue to, to come out here, to continue to meet out here, 
And I know that when we're out here, when people are online participating later with this online, I know that, that um, they can connect with you just like if they were sitting here. And so my prayer, Father, is that we would connect with you, that we wouldn't have the wrong kind of wisdom, that we would be able to pursue your purposes and your kingdom and what you want and have the right purposes that we would have the right kind of wisdom to be able to pursue the good life in the way that you have made for us. We thank you in advance for what you're going to do and how you're going to do it in our lives. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And normally I say stand, but I'm not going to say that because then the people in the cars won't see. So we're all going to stay seated. I'm going to (laughs) trip.
I'm not getting old. I'm just moving slow. It's okay. Let me ask you this. What kind of wisdom do you want? Because you get to choose. So when you decide what kind you want, what are you going to do about it? Because whichever one you choose, there's a pathway to that. Remember, we talked about some commitments last week, just very briefly about trusting Jesus as Savior, being all in, and asking the question, who really owns my life? Is it me or Jesus? A daily time with Jesus in the Bible. A daily time praying together as a church. I've been, uh, it's been fun hearing the comments of those who are praying at either 8 a.m. or 8 p.m. Um, and if you saw online, I set my watch for both so I can be praying with you at 8 a.m. or 8 p.m. And I actually have people from my high school who I didn't even know knew that I was alive. I haven't talked to in like 40, well, not like, I haven't talked to in 45 years. Um, they're in many parts of America praying at 8 a.m. or p.m. It's kind of exciting. We talked about the, the small group microsite thing, being a positive change instead of a critic, volunteering, just making a commitment, whatever your next step is. Here's what I'm, I'm going to, I'm not adding to that. I'm going to say habits are good things if they're good habits. So I have a couple new habits that I think we need to form. Here's the first one. Establish a Sunday morning routine. Because I know it's going to, it fluxes because of summer and sometimes you're camping or doing this or doing that. But we, we get used to coming and gathering on Sunday morning and now all of a sudden we can't do that like we used to. It might be a good idea to take your family and establish some kind of routine we're going to watch together. We're going to discuss this together, maybe even with your small group. Um, another good habit is to establish that small group routine and say it's online or it's, it's this or that, but we're going to make this work. Um, another new habit is find ways to keep your kids connected. Bree puts some great stuff online and does some things that can help um, families keep the kids connected. And then, as we just said, another good habit is to do every single day is pray. Pray for your church. Pray for your community. Pray for the country because prayer is what's going to change things. It would be really easy to watch the news and get depressed. But when we do the right thing, when we put Jesus first and others second, and we're somewhere down the line, and we're genuinely concerned about others, and we're doing it in humility, God can do great things in your life. He can bring more into your life than you could ever imagine. So next week, you know what's happening next week? Uh, I'm asking. I have no idea. <laughs> I, I don't know what's happening next week. You have, you have, we have no idea. You have to keep watching. We watch the weather and see, and it's Minnesota, so the weather changes by the minute. So we may be out here. We may be online. I don't know what time it is. We always said from the very beginning of Journey, Journey in Our Church, this is a church for smart people because you got to know when and where we are because sometimes we don't even know that. <laughs> so be watching and listening. You can go to the website. We'll put journeyinourchurch.com. We'll put updates right at the top at the beginning, so that um, as we start to see what we're going to do, we'll kind of put that on there. But it'll either be like out here or online unless miracles happen. We just, you don't know what's going to happen in this situation. So let me pray. And I know, it's, I know it's warm. I know it's warm. I know some of you are warm just because when I look down at my notes, the reflection is causing heat to come off. Um, and that's a bad thing. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the, the ability to be out here. Um, just holding your name high, and I pray that we would hear from you as we hear from your word, but that we wouldn't be hearers of the word only, that we would be doers of the word, that we would have the right kind of wisdom and be able to demonstrate that with our lives. And Father, we just thank you for, um, in the middle of this craziness, the opportunity that we have to connect with you, to connect with others, and to see your purposes worked out in our life. We thank you and we love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.